uh, a deep crisis. Uh, I think a lot of uh, issues that I will be raising has to do with the lack of uh, judiciary independence in, in Turkey, and uh, which which has been uh, a structure which has been uh, deteriorated over the last uh, ten years uh, at the structural level, but uh, over the last three years, uh, much more interfered by the government uh, instructions. Uh, I will give you an example, uh, 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 concrete cases, and you will be noticing how dramatic is uh, the, the consequences in this political interference. We, were pros we are prosecuted uh, for more than five years for taking part to a solidarity campaign uh, for uh, this pro-Kurdish newspaper, Özgürgen Dem. Uh, uh, we were acquitted in July 2019, but when the President Erdogan targeted my co-defendant, Shebnem Korur Finjanje, last October, immediately the same month, Istanbul Regional Appeal Court has cancelled these acquittals. So the case has started again, and we are still facing, five years later, we are still facing uh, 15 years of prison together. So this is, a, uh, this is an accept, uh, unacceptable uh, interference, but this is a daily issue for human rights defenders, critical journalists or criti uh, critical MPs, politicians in Turkey, who are uh, prosecuted uh, for their view or for their uh, freedom of expression st stand. Uh, if Turkey wants to be a part of European Union, we don't need a miracle. There are very simple issues to deal with. You can lift uh, the article on insulting the president so far, 65 journalists and media representatives were sentenced to prison or to fine for criticizing the president in, this pres in his presidential term. You, you lift these articles, you submit uh, anti-terror law to a stri uh, strict control check of high judiciary and and uh, put an obligation, uh, uh, concrete standards for the same. But of course, I think uh, Turkey strategically has nothing to do in the recent years with the spirit of uh, uh, fundamental rights. This is not the, 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 the issue for the government. The aim is to take the control politically of the government and to weaken all kind of dissent or all kind of criticism uh, from, from media or from the political sphere. And I, I, I'm still very surprised why we are uh, at the diplomatic uh, ground, we are still referring to EU membership. I, I, I'm sure that we are not anymore there uh, since many years. So uh, th there is a deep crisis uh, uh, and a deep crackdown uh, targeting critical journalists. Uh, online censorship is a daily issue in Turkey. Uh, 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 just one single judge put ban to dozens of uh, link of articles and without any argument, and the entire arbitrariness. And nobody tell, nobody check, nobody is really able to resist against this uh, arbitrariness. So uh, for the first time in the uh, re recent, uh, for the first time in, in media history, a government is si uh, keep silent 
when critical journalists are submit to a physical attack in the street and are letting do uh, as if it is contributing to their daily policy. So I can, uh, I can multiply such uh, examples, but uh, uh, I think that all these examples are enough to il illustrate on many uh, level uh, arbitrariness and uh, threat that Turkish journalists are facing in recent years. Well, thank you for that overview. And I actually want to pick up on this uh, thought about arbitrariness. Um, and uh, Burhan, I would like to turn to you with this question, um, because this is something, uh, the arbitrariness or unpredictability of what the government will react to. This is a direct quote from the report. Many of the interviewees of the of the Pan America report seem to be complaining about, um, you know, this arbitrariness leaving uh, people really unsure what they can say or write without falling into the government's crosshairs. Um, can you uh, delve into this a little bit? I mean, is this repression really arbitrary? Um, because I mean, on the one hand it is, but there's also, I mean, do you see a particular pattern to it or a section of society or multiple sections of society that you would describe as particularly under threat? Thank you, Merve, and hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks to Pan America and Fomet. Uh, when we talk about Turkey, unfortunately, we are always talking about bad things and worrying things, and we share our concerns, not about ourselves, but about, about our friends and about the future of our uh, country. When it comes to the arbitrariness, I think it's uh, a political strategy. The thing that we see as arbitrary is building uh, something in favor of the government. It is not just something new started with Erdogan. We know that um, the current situation of Turkey maybe uh, started about 40 years ago with the 1980 military coup. Since then, any government came into power, more or less um, applied the same policy, uh, but they always competed with each other. Uh, which one is going to be worse than uh, the previous one. Now Erdogan, I think, is the best, you know, at being the worst uh, leader uh, in the last uh, 40 years, because he's been doing everything that uh, not right before. When, for example, a couple of months ago, he said that Turkey is canceling Istanbul Convention for protecting women against violations, you know, a convention that started by the initiative of Turkey about 10 years ago and supported by European Union, supported by 45 countries. But two months ago, uh, in the middle of night, literally in the middle of night, Erdogan published a decree and said that Turkey is out of Istanbul um, Convention, not defending women anymore. Why? Is it something uh, very serious or very really important for the government's um, future program or around the same time a couple of uh, a few months ago they said okay we are going to turn um, Hagia Sophia museum into mosque again after 60 70 years why um, that kind of things creating a wave of shock in public but on the other hand he's um, gathering his supporters because his power on one hand is now uh, shattering he's losing power he knows that and he needs to get uh, those people and those religious sects around himself again and he's got only one option to use the um, the means of violence against um, uh, opposition he cannot have uh, any power to have discussion with Kurds or to solve the problem of uh, Alevite society or have any communication uh, on women uh, issues or LGBT uh, issues. No, he got his own agenda uh, with the power of Turkey's um, traditional structure and he got now his Islamist also view. He is just going ahead. He's playing um, with the dice every day. Uh, when we see that kind of arbitrariness, 
we sometimes feel panic because we don't know what is going to uh, tomorrow. Kind of being unpredicted. He likes to be unpredicted. Uh, but now we know that uh, he got an idea. He would like to get rid of any kind of opposition. He hates free journalism. He hates, for example, Errol is here. Errol is his number one enemy, or Asena or Caroline, because people uh, still uh, have courage to say no. That's why Erdogan, when he came into power about uh, 20 years ago, the number of people in prison uh, were 70,000. Now, 300,000 people in prison in Turkey. And only in this year, the government promised to build 49 new prisons. That's the future they see for Turkey. Um, putting more pressure on opposition, on journalists, academics, you know, free thinkers, women uh, movement, Kurdish movement, and carry on with their own agenda. The question is then about us. What are we going to do? Are we going to give up our hope or we will say tomorrow will be better? That's the question for us. I have my own answer, but we will talk about it. I hope nobody gives up, even though there are dire consequences for everyone who seems to be critical of the government. <laughs> I hope nobody gives up and continues on. Um, actually, Asena, I would like to uh, continue with you um, and uh, ask you about the repression of, I mean, you know, Burhan mentioned you as one of the sort of public enemies these days, and particularly your organization, uh, Anadolu Kultur, is one of them. So I'd like to ask you um, about the repression of cultural civil society groups, uh, particularly those engaged with the arts to promote human rights like yours. Um, how is the government building its intimidation tactics, as I would call it, against these NGOs? And uh, just so to give us a better understanding of the impact of this repression, would you tell us a bit the story of Anadolu Kultur itself specifically, why it was founded, why it focuses on the arts, and why the government considers these activities a, a threat. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for, to Pan America for organizing this meeting. Um, actually, I would like to talk about the situation of cultural rights first. I mean, the, the, the cultural rights are more than just an ingredient to the international human rights framework, participation in cultural life of the society on the one hand and freedom of expression on the other are indispensable rights of every human being. However, for many years in Turkey, participation in cultural life and freedom of artistic expression remained as a side issue because there were more pressing concerns such as torture and forced disappearances, imprisonment, and the struggle for human rights was the one carried out by I mean, human rights association, the lawyers who ran to police stations when people were detained, Saturday mothers who gathered every week despite all obstacles. But today in the field of human rights in Turkey, yeah, the, the, the field of human rights in Turkey has expanded to include culture. And there are two reasons for this. And one of them is that people have become aware of the importance of access to artistic expression and culture and arts in the framework of human rights. And the other reason is that state oppression on culture, arts and civil society has increased. Here, I would like to, of course, particularly underline the ongoing unjust detention of Osman Kavala that began three and a half years ago and the following oppression and unfounded allegations that made him a target. Osman Kavala founded Anadolu Kultur in 2002 to implement various projects through culture and arts, to establish local, regional, international collaborations, to support the production and sharing of cultural and artistic works, to incorporate suppressed histories into collective memory and to open up channels for dialogue with Armenia and so. So the works may be diversified in time, but uh, they were adapted to the changing needs of the society, but yet they rely on the principle that arts and culture, by keeping imagination, curiosity, and hope alive, have a crucial role in making a pluralistic, democratic, and free country. But as we can see, the uh, current regime is not fond of those cultural and artistic activities, for example, when you read the second in indictment regarding Osman Kavala, which was on this observed espionage charge, you can see that the way the, the public prosecutor sees those cultural and artistic activities as part of 
espionage activities and as part of some conspiracy theories which want to divide the country. So the way they look at culture and arts and the way they look at our activities are, I mean, for me a bit sick, I mean, very much based on conspiracy theories. And actually what happened to Osman Bey and to Anadolu Kultur is not unique. I mean, we, ha we have been living this, I mean, the cultural and artistic institutions have been living this for uh, a long time. Uh, before the state of emergency, for example, a direct government ban on artistic production was just one of the many forms of censorship uh, that we encountered in the field of freedom of expression. And it was actually not the most frequently employed method. Verbal and written threats against individuals and art institutions were used more often as tools of silencing. But along with the state of emergency, legal methods came into more frequent use and within the environment of oppression in the country, of course, culture and art institutions and their actors also began to engage in self-censorship in varying degrees. And when so many journalists and right defenders are in jail and the myriad of associations and foundations have been shut down, of course, cultural institutions, I mean, take measures themselves. And they usually, I mean, kept silence in the face of the pressures, especially with concerns over disrupting the relationship between the government and the big capital that sponsors them. Because it's usually the, uh, the big business families which back the cultural institutions in Turkey. And as they don't want to risk their relations with the regime, they, they were silent on, even on the, side, on the case of Osman Bey, whom they collaborated for a long time. So, I mean, they, they say we are dealing with the regime strategically. We are finding ways to I mean, continue our work, but I don't know whether the silences will continue protecting them. Yeah. That's a really dark picture, but thanks for um, highlighting that connection of the economic relationship that the state has built over these, you know, last almost 20 years now in power uh, and, you know, how that helps, uh, I guess, enable this censorship in Turkey, which is really a grim picture. Um, Caroline, I want to turn to you uh, on this question of using the legal system as a weapon, as in the case of uh, Osman Kavala and Anadolu Kultur and many others. Um, Penn Norway uh, recently, I believe last year, uh, launched a Turkey indictment project, uh, looking at whether these indictments that Turkish prosecutors are bringing forth against writers and journalists and artists meet international standards. And you know, I, I've studied some of them, so I know they don't. But would you tell us a bit about your project and your key findings and why you launched it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Merve. And it's very good to hear my, my colleagues uh, here today. You've got Penn, America and Palmet have put together an excellent panel. Um, it is a dark picture and it is something that Turkey and the Turkish and Kurdish people have to fix. But with pressure, I think pressure should come from uh, the American administration and from European governments, much stronger pressure on, on Erdogan, because this is not really, we're not just talking about how bad Turkey is, we are talking about an, an administration which is abusing um, rights and freedoms in the constitution and, and other places. So to come to the indictment project, we, um, as you know, with being a member of the Penn family, we study uh, linguistic rights, right of imprison we support and, um, and, and freedom of expression. And these, this report came about as a consequence of our trial monitoring. So Penn Norway has been monitoring trials in Turkey for 30 years or so. Um, I've been monitoring them myself in person for eight years. And I think we decided to look at the very basis of the trials. We, we've attended these show trials, such as the terrible ongoing judicial harassment of Erol, who's here today, and also Osman Kavala, I think is the most distressing case. The two biggest sort of outrageous cases really in, in Turkey today, are, or detentions rather, I would say, are Selatin Demirtas, who's the, uh, of the HDP uh, party, and also Osman Kavala, who's actually a political hostage. If you look at the indictments that we reported upon both of these cases against Osman Bey, who that have now been um, put together in there's a very large group case now, which is ongoing in the next hearings, 5th, 5th of August, there's no there is no evidence that, that all of these uh, uh, defendants in the in the Gezi trial there were 16 of them they were acquitted after i think there were seven public hearings and two private hearings and then the judge acquitted them all in a shock acquittal i would say in the, in the, uh, the court in Silivri 
because he found that, or the judicial panel rather, found that some of the evidence, a lot of the evidence in the in the indictment had been gathered illegally or had been ordered, phone tappings were gathered illegally. What we've done with our indictment project is to look at 12 indictments in the cases of writers, we're now moving on to cinematographers as well, uh, and journalists, and we used a panel of a, a team of excellent lawyers and judges from the United Kingdom, from Turkey, from um, Austria and Norway, and they compared the very basic documents that with which a person is indicted, they compared it to Article 170 of the Turkish Procedural Code, so the domestic requirements of what should be in an indictment, are they there? Not one of them met the basic domestic standard. Did they meet the criteria in Articles 5 and 6 of the European Convention concerning the right to a fair trial? They did not. Did they meet the UN guidelines for prosecutors, they didn't meet those either. So this is, we have just studied 12 and we studied the cases that we know quite well, as well as those of journal, Kurdish journalists like Nedim Turfent and um, Barizan Gunesh. And I would say we must always look at the whole of Turkey, not just Istanbul, not just high profile cases. You need to look at the entire country. And I think NGOs, a way of supporting people in Turkey who have been deprived so badly of their rights and freedoms is to do is for organizations like PEN to do concrete practical studies and gather data and then use that for advocacy because it's not the time for us all to share bad news about Turkey any longer. That was 2018 when, as uh, Karen said earlier, they closed 85, 185 media organizations and 53 newspapers. And that has sealed off you know, the right of the public to hear news from various sources and become rounded, well-informed citizens. Um, but, but yes, the, the indictment project is, um, I very, very briefly sh uh, share the screen just to show you the, um, the actual, beg your pardon, make it on the slide here for a second. Well, I, I, I don't think I will screen share. This always happens, doesn't it? Every time you try to do a... <laughs> A Zoom, but I will post it in the chat if people would like to have a look. Yeah, I was going to say because I think it would be really useful, and or people can just Google it as well. Um, I think it's a really strong, important project that documents what's going on. Um, well, with that, actually, uh, I'll move on to my second round of questions for you all, which is going to be a hard question, but you've all sort of uh, alluded to this already in some of your answers, particularly now with um, Caroline. It's clear that uh, a lot of these cases in Turkey um, that's enabling the repression uh, is also violating international you know, norms and laws and UN guidelines and um, also the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so this is a hard question, but I would really love to get all of your responses to it. This you know, slide into the repression is not happening in a vacuum. It's actually happening at an important point for Erdogan's relationship with both Europe and the United States. Um, and it's clear that Erdogan uh, wants to be able to both implement these repressive measures, but at the same time, enjoy a, a status as a member, as an you know, international member in good standing uh, with the international community. So could you all um, briefly comment on how you see the role that the international community has so far played in Erdogan's repression and what would you like to see instead particularly from the United States and Europe and uh, multilateral institutions and uh, I'll actually go back uh, uh, to Erol and, and why don't we start with you you also mentioned uh, Turkey and the EU membership so I think this would be a great way to get back to you Thank you for your question. Uh, I think advocacy groups and human rights defenders in Turkey and abroad were the first to warn international community uh, about uh, this deviation of policy from Turkish government and the idea that such a uh, such a um, counterpart would not be so constructive with Euro Europe, neither with uh, United States. 
with the nations built on uh, real democratic values. And today we came at this point where European Union is just tolerate, seems to tolerate a country which is on one hand abusing fundamental rights, but on other hand proposing a vital geostrategic uh, stand to U European Union. I really wonder uh, until when this this, uh, how to say, this, uh, these negotiations or this uh, exchange uh, will, uh, will last. But I think that we came to, uh, and at the domestic level, Turkey uh, reflect a, 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 a very serious sign of a deep political uh, crisis. I don't know how Turkey will be approaching to 2023 uh, elections, which will be crucial, which will, that Erdogan will, uh, in one way or in another, would like to win. But uh, at the uh, social level, I think that Turkey is exposed to a uh, extremely uh, serious uh, polarization. So all these factors uh, uh, are not so digerable in my view at the international scene. I, I don't know if this, uh, uh, the fact that uh, Erdogan uh, will be approaching more to European Union because of being weakened at the poli at the uh, at the political level, uh, at least at uh, electoral uh, on electoral results. I don't know, but uh, this tolerance toward Turkey is very disturbing. Uh, myself as a journalist, as a uh, as as a person who deeply believe to uh, democratic uh, fundamental rights. And it's more, it's, uh, more and more difficult to tolerate this in a daily life. And as, a, as an actor of, uh, of uh, human rights circles. So, uh, but I don't think that a Council of Europe or such a strategic, uh, uh, actor will uh, break uh, break the game with Turkey, uh, and uh, and uh, will sub will uh, sacrifice sac such a geostrategic actor. Unfortunately, I don't I don't uh, I don't believe so. But I, uh, it's uh, it's more than late to see Turkish government warn at the, uh, at the serious level because of, of uh, uh, these human rights records. So I guess you, you agree with a lot of the respondents to this uh, Pan America report that you know, they find that the role of the international community so far is kind of unnerving uh, in how they played and you take a, a dark view of the geostrategic <laughs> relationship that it's very difficult to be to be optimistic when you see clearly that uh, all this democratic institutionalization heritage has been dismantled or in a, is in a, in a in a process to be dismantled over the last ten years. So this is uh, may, uh, this is what creates a real pessimism uh, on me. But suddenly. Uh, could Turkey take a good path after meeting all this, all this uh, deep crisis uh, or all this deep uh, polarization? I, I think uh, all I wish is that we should not face the 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 the, the, uh, the worst. Let's say. 
I hope so. Uh, Burhan, do you agree with this uh, assessment of the international community's role and, you know, uh, potentially, you know, the, again, uh, pessimistic view of what uh, Europe can and in America can and cannot do? Uh, thank you. Um, unfortunately, usually I say I agree with a role. Now I have to say again the same thing um, about the situation. Um, when we look at the Erdogan's power of 20 years, nearly 20 years, and it's been 19 years, I can divide it into two parts. The first half uh, was uh, fully and openly supported and um, built by Western countries. We were alone in Turkey. Right from the beginning, we were against Erdogan. Uh, intellectuals, journalists, writers, so many people. And then European countries and United States, so many Western powers always looked at us like zealots, like madmen. Why don't you support Erdogan, they say. I remember one meeting I participated about 10 years ago at the University of Cambridge. When I started to talk against Erdogan, one European academic just left me alone and he stopped uh, speaking to me because Erdogan was uh, the rising star. But now, thanks to the situation and thanks to the opposition of Turkey and, and you know, uh, people in Turkey since Gezi uprising, and people started to criticize Erdogan, uh, you know, outside Turkey as we did in Turkey. This is the one part now. Uh, but Erdogan is still very strong uh, because the politics, something uh, if we talk about it theoretically, is something dirty as Tolstoy always said, uh, you know, he would uh, say, especially towards the end of his uh, life, never trust state, never trust government. Uh, we writers, uh, we follow Tolstoy not only in his writing, but also in his advices. We don't trust governments uh, because even today, while Turkey is on fire, European Union is struggling new deals with Erdogan Pay him, paying him 3 billion euros to keep Syrian and Afghan refugees in the borders of Turkey. So that means Turkey is a good neighbor for European country because they gave money and Erdogan, um, you know, carries out uh, their work. Or with the NATO, two weeks ago, Erdogan uh, met with NATO leaders, including um, Biden. What was the result? Now, United States said, okay, we got a good agreement with Turkey. We are leaving Afghanistan and Turkey will be replacing us in Afghanistan. For what? What's going on behind the curtains while we are losing our lives, while thousands of our friends are decaying behind bars? Why? Because some people, some powers, you know, dealing with some other things. They don't have the same concern we have about human rights or free expression. So what can we say about the international community? I think when we say international community, the first thing, you know, comes into my mind is Pan-International, Pan-America or PUMAT or RSF. These are international community for us. The governments, the power that we have to put pressure on you know, not to trust, not to leave our destiny into their hands, because we know that. When the one thing I would expect from international community, they shouldn't put pressure on Erdogan. It is our job. We are doing that in Turkey. They should put pressure on their own governments. Their governments should stop dirty relations with Turkey or similar country with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, you know, with all those, you know, you can imagine uh, typical uh, similar powers because dictators copy each other. You know, we literature, uh, the man of literature always refrain from copying each other. We always try to be uh, a very unique, uh, special writer, but politicians always tend to copy each other. They like, you know, practicing the same thing that uh, another guy uh, achieved in another country. We are not talking about the era of uh, Hitler or Mussolini. We are talking about the era of Putin, Erdogan, Duterte, you know, Orban, 
so many of them, you know, uh, across, uh, okay, in the United States, you got rid of a bad guy recently. I hope you won't have another bad guy uh, in your, uh, on your land. But, as, uh, you know, as last words, I, uh, I should repeat, international community should work, should support us. We need that. And we appreciate that. And also they sh uh, should put pressure on their own governments while we are dealing with Erdogan. Thank you for that very elaborate response. And I have to say, I completely share your, and I think many of us working on human rights here in Washington share your disappointment with uh, particularly the Biden administration's response in NATO uh, with the Afghanistan deal with, with Turkey, um, uh, especially the Biden administration, which, you know, boasts that it, it cares about human rights and democracy and wants to put it at the center of its uh, foreign policy. It's quite disappointing uh, to see the outcome so far. Um, but let me turn to uh, Asena. Um, I mean, both, again, the same question to you. I'm particularly interested in your response, given, uh, you know, Osman, the very international dimension to Osman Kavala's case and uh, perhaps your expectations of the international community and uh, multilateral institutions like the Council of Europe are higher or <laughs> uh, how would you respond to this? How could Europe and the US and the international community do better? Yeah, actually, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with Burhan. How do you define international community? What is international community for us? In our case, in the case of Osman Bey and this closure lawsuit against Anadolu culture, in all these, I mean, the, 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 the repression that we have been facing in the last three and a half years, we did not feel alone at any moment. There was always the support and solidarity of the NGOs, funders, human rights organizations, artists, art workers in Turkey and abroad. And especially, I mean, those institutions abroad showed uh, great solidarity with us. And that's how we continue to actually function. And for example, they could make public statements that all the European institutions that we have been collaborating with, they, they put pressure on their own governments. We know that, I mean, through these public statements or through their one-to-one -one contacts. But, um, and I mean, I have been talking to the diplomats about the case of Osman Kavala, I mean, for years, I don't know how many presentations I did to the diplomats. And I feel like, I mean, sometimes I feel really alienated because the diplomats are changing, the cultural attaché is changing, the political attaché is changing. I mean, the EU delegation in Ankara is changing, but I'm repeating the same things. I mean, not the, 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 I mean, the lack of rule of law, the lack of independence of the judiciary, the, I mean, the, the, the use of judiciary to suppress opposition, and of course, all that, I mean, horrible things uh, regarding the case of Osman Bey, which is, I mean, completely unlawful, completely unjust and illegal. So I'm repeating this to the diplomats all the time but what's happening and whenever they whenever I make this presentation they ask me oh what can we do for you so I'm also a bit tired of this question too I mean the thing that you can do is I mean I mean pushing Erdogan to I mean comply with the rules of the for example the European Court of Human Rights at least and I mean they say oh we are doing it we are talking about this behind the closed doors come on I mean Merkel had just this deal with Erdogan in the EU summit Burhan mentioned I mean for the three million euros just to keep the Syrian refugees and Afghan refugees in Turkey just to fortify the borders. Even they expanded the customs union as if they're promoting Erdogan regime. So, I mean, when it comes to Hungary, uh, they say, uh, you should be careful about LGBT rights to Hungary. Come on. I'm sure you have seen what happened in the Pride March in the weekend in Istanbul. And they are putting pressure on Russia and Belarus uh, for the uh, pressure on journalists. I mean, how many journalists are in prison in Turkey? So they turn a blind eye on all those human rights violations and, I mean, continue with their dirty deal with Erdogan. So what I expect is actually to keep this dirty deal behind and, I mean, put pressure on Erdogan and force him uh, to comply with the rules of the international uh, law and, I mean, apply the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. The European Council Committee of Ministers had been discussing this in all its meetings, uh, I mean, talking about the infringement procedures and the years past. I mean, it has been three and a half years. I mean, after the verdict of the European Court of Human Rights, it has been two and a half 
peers. So what did they do? Uh, they're still discussing the infringement procedures. Thanks a lot. I mean, that, you know, Osman Bey is not young. He, he is, I mean, 64 and he has been spending, I mean, a long time in prison and they're still discussing in their diplomatic circles. So I don't know. I mean, I feel good about the international community when it comes to, as I said, the NGOs and the artistic and cultural community. But I, I can say I lost my trust in the, in the governments. Can I ask a quick follow up to you about this? Because the sure particularly the story you told about you know briefing the diplomats and and hearing from various governments that oh we are we are putting pressure do you think that part of the problem and then you gave the example of america um uh, do you think part of the problem might be that european governments who are interested in democracy and human rights issues in turkey are sending that message but at the lower levels and ultimately um that message doesn't come across to erdogan and his government unless it comes from higher levels, like from Chancellor Merkel herself or President Biden here himself. And the low level, you know, diplomats filing a few statements here and there doesn't seem to change anything in the government's behavior. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And actually, this is what I heard about Erdogan Biden talk. I mean, I heard that, that Biden didn't mention names. Biden, of course, mentioned maybe in general something about human rights in a vague fashion. But at the lower level, there were names. And um, yeah, some American uh, officials mentioned the name of Osman Bey. But as you said, it doesn't go up. I mean, there is a barrier there. And that barrier is, unfortunately, the strategic position of Turkey and the refugee deal. Uh, thanks. I think I hope uh, there are uh, policymakers who are watching this and, and taking notes from from this discussion. Uh, Caroline, I'll turn to you with again the same question, but uh, in particular the role of I would say the Council of Europe, as we just talked about, the Turkey not following the European Court of Human Rights uh, decisions, which it's legally obligated to do. And um, you know, as Senna mentioned, the infringement process that they've been talking about for many years. Do you think that you know that is something that the Council of Europe is ready to do or willing to do and should do? Well, it's it's interesting. I think there are a lot of options for, for governments, for different administrations. I think there's a lot of options for America, there are options for Europe, there are also options for the people and for PEN members. But, but to, to, to mention, I mean, the Council of Ministers, as Asina Hanum said, you know, they, they may well go through infringement procedures. They may take a long time. And what will be the actual um, enforcement after that. I mean, I would I would recommend that, that the Secretary General of the Council of Europe actually chastises Turkey now for constant flagrant, um, you know, violations of the European Convention on a daily basis. So the indictments that we looked at, they've been churned out um, and they are, there is no reasoning in them between the crime and the evidence and the defendant. So they are not, uh, they, they're violating the European Convention and their own constitution on a daily basis. This is willful behavior. If you look at the state of emergency from 2016 till 2018, the Venice Commission, which is part of the Council of Europe, did a report and they, they decided, or they found, that the state of emergency really only lasted for 48 hours after the attempted coup. And yet the, well, I beg your pardon, the threat to national security only lasted for 48 hours. And yet the state of emergency went on for two years, in which time through emergency decrees, the entire country was, this, all everything was dismantled, the universities, the legal system, tens of thousands of, of judges in, uh, were, were locked up. And, so there is great damage there. I think what we have to look at is what does Erdogan care about? How will he change? Everything, everything lies with him, unfortunately. And therefore, the, I think, the, or, and whoever is behind him, I think, the, I, think I would just recommend to, to the Biden administration uh, to, to, to use their credit facility, um, because I think that's what will have absolute change. We don't know what, what Biden's approach will really be yet. I don't think we've had long enough or enough um, evidence to see what he's actually planning because he does believe in, in rights and freedoms and democracy. But it has to be, I mean, the European Convention, I beg your pardon, the um, European Parliament, for example, does Turkey really want to be a member at the moment? Does Erdogan and do the AKP want to become, they're a candidate country, do they want to go down the accession process further? 
I don't think they do because it's been eight or nine years with no progress on the now 11 particular points that the count that the um, the parliament has for them to conform to they have not made progress there is zero political will other other countries in the east of europe when they've been entered into the accession progress have sped along because they've wanted to change everything in their country but again we must remember there is there is will amongst the people in turkey it's the administration that does not want to move on this and to deny they deny that there is a problem with freedom of expression they now passed a social media law to, to clamp down on social media providers and try and force them to share all the data of users with the Turkish government. And if pressure isn't put on this administration and, and if, if the Erdogan is re-elected as president, then he may well follow Putin's example and become president for life. So very quickly then, the, the, um, the European Parliament has a Turkey rapporteur, Nacho Sanchez Amor. He will be recommending that Turkey's no longer in the accession process. The European Parliament might vote for that again, as they did with Katy Piri's report. But it's only the heads of state in Europe that can really make a difference there. They can stop Turkey from being part of the accession process. Um, they can, uh, the people of PACE, the par uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, can ask the Venice Commission to undertake further reports I would say they should look into the um, th they should look into the the problems with the judiciary the fact that there is absolutely no independence our report does show uh, in articles and infographics as well as the reports it shows the history of the Turkish judiciary there's a mapping there of how a court case proceeds through through the, through the system um, and also the changes to bars associations. Uh, a law was passed, constitutional change, so that bar, the Istanbul bar, instead of having 153 members in the Turkish uh, council, the, the uh, Union of Turkish Bar Associations, will go down to 13. So there's, there's so many um, very anti-democratic moves going on. Um, so another recommendation I would say for the European Court of Human Rights, if they, if they agree there is no domestic legal a, a recourse in Turkey, if they admit that the, that, that the system is broken, they will have something like 24,000 cases on their desk. So that's what we don't want to damage or swamp the European court, but they could rule on pilot cases. They could look at all these cases, rule on one, and that judgment could be applied to many others. We would want them to be stronger on Turkey, uh, more radical in their decisions. Ahmet Altan is finally free. It, it took eight years. I mean, for, for the, beg your pardon, it took since 2016, his, his brother's case was, beg your pardon, his brother's Ahmet Altan in the same case had a judgment from the European Court in 2018 in March. Uh, and, and yet Ahmet Altan's has only just come now. So there's many, many different areas. Um, and another one finally that is, is another option is that there is an interstate case. And that is a really quite serious diplomatic move. If, if certain heads of European countries got together and took out an interstate case against Turkey at the European court, it would have to be heard immediately. They could look at all the media closures, the seizing of assets from all the media companies and all the television companies that were closed. They could look at the mass arrests and people being sacked from their jobs um, and blatant uh, infringements of the convention on a daily basis. But if I could just finally say then, what can people do? And in fact, what people can do is really powerful. And it's, it's, it's I think we can move far more freely and faster than these big political actors, even though they, they really changed the game. We can support our colleagues in Turkey. It is their fight. They do go through these terrible cycles sometimes every 30 years and they continue to resist and they continue to work. And I am completely in awe of my colleagues there, of Burhan, of, of, of Erol, of Asena and her work. And what, what Anadolu Kutu does is international arts projects that should be bringing us together. And so I think that there should be more peer-to-peer -peer support. I think people should join PEN in whichever country they are. They can, if they're a journalist, they can write to a journalist in prison. They can make friends with them. They can have the letter translated or write in English. Nedim Turfent uh, is a journalist in prison. He, a, a completely innocent man with eight years, nine months sentence. Um, there is 50 to 70,000 students in prison in Turkey. They are the future writers. Many of them will be Kurdish, swept up under the anti-terror law, uh, the culling of a gen of generation. So I think you could look at making masterclasses in 
different forms of the arts and sending them in translation in Turkish and Kurdish into the prisons so that whilst in prison at least they can have an education with some of the world's experts in these areas. Um, and just supporting um, one's colleagues, uh, you know, in whatever area you are, you can, I think also as international, and this is my final word really, as international organisations and NGOs, we have to support, we mustn't have the, the orientalist approach of looking at Turkey and trying to make them fit all of our standards and everything. We have to trust our colleagues and friends in Turkey and support them on the ground. Every time we go, there must be a lot of information gathering. You need, there are great NGOs there. So, you know, many different LGBTQI communities terribly oppressed in the trans community in Turkey now. So they, they all need support, the students of Wazji and elsewhere. I would say that they, you can support independent newspapers with subscriptions, you can, you can fund um, the NGOs which are, who are already very effective, we've got amazing staff members doing great work, so we should empower, not always can we just fight this, the, the figure of oppression, but we should be looking at writing the new utopia and working with people to, to strengthen their great work which is happening in Turkey already. Uh, thank you for, for those, I think, excellent recommendations, and I particularly agree with the people-to-people -people support and solidarity aspect of it. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that is really powerful. I thought, you know, that the master's classes, for example, is a great idea. Um, I am going to turn now to use our last 15 minutes that we have here um, on audience questions, and I have, I have them coming from various places, so sorry. Um, uh, but actually, this last point really um, neatly ties into the first question that I, um, and I think I want to ask it to Errol, um, because, you know, we just talked about the future poets, future um, literary writers, and, and, you know, the kinds of uh, threats that they are facing, which to me is the most, one of the most destructive elements of this repression. Um, what about you know, to be journalists. So young journalists, this, this is a question about the impact of uh, repression on journalism in Turkey as a profession, and particularly on younger journalists who are just entering uh, the profession. Um, uh, Errol, as our journalist on board, <laughs> um, I will switch this question to you. And... I think that uh, the rep Repression finally creates some uh, some special uh, social ground where young people um, once uh, have uh, have some ideals, and uh, young people wants to be journalists. Young people wants to be lawyers for safeguard of their own society, and I'm very happy to. To see that, although this uh, the level of the repressions, we we are approached by many many young journalists very eager to have their place in online journalism circles, and uh, th they are sharing the same uh, ideal uh, of their country uh, because they don't have any other choices and they have to take the lead of, of uh, to fight against this. Uh, I think that the, this uh, ideal to, uh, to share this Western way of life, uh, uh, the values of democratic societies is not something fake. It has a deep, deep, uh, um, it has a deep impact in, in, in in, in, the, in the biggest part of Turkish society. So uh, all these young people, in a way, find their place. And the sector, although the sec media sector is very weak, badly paid, and, uh, uh, but uh, th there are uh, some roles for young people and they are, uh, they are mostly eager to, to play their, their, their role. And uh, I'm very happy uh, for that. Yeah, you're saying more and more people are joining the profession. So hopefully they'll have, a, a, they'll, they'll, you know, 
practice journalistic integrity and try to report the truth uh, uh, no matter what the conditions are especially when the conditions are like this in the country um, just a quick follow-up on that um, for Burhan how do you see this situation impacting in the same way um, existing and aspiring uh, particularly aspiring writers uh, yeah thank you um, about two years ago um, uh, politician uh, in the AKP in Erdogan's uh, um, administration said that in this country we managed um, to possess everything. They meant, you know, army and press, police, uh, academy, everything. Then he said the only place is the cultural field. We couldn't dominate yet. That's what you know they are fighting for at the moment that's why they are putting journalists academics writers lawyers into prison they beat them uh, they try to corner them still i'm very much surprised with our people you know with people of turkey kurdish people alevite community you know uh, especially women's uh, movement uh, is one of the you know great hope uh, in our society at the moment um, they are resisting they are resisting fiercely and in every opportunity they are cre creating new ways of resistance when it comes to writers now uh, i have to uh, confess something now for my generation being um, a political writer is very easy because we were born uh, you know in the time of 1980 military coups and we learned from the previous very active and you know influential uh, generations but for the new generation writers i see they are more radical than i am for example they write um, you know about any kind of sensitive issues about armenian issue kurdish issue you know um, or in any other you can name uh, and the number of writers are increasing all the time and on the social media now we see people are writing openly, criticizing government without fear because you can or you just go to prison because of a tweet you write or you just to share, to retweet something, then you can find yourself uh, into prison. But you, you go to on you know those, uh, those kind of uh, social media platforms, you feel that people are mad. They write, they say, uh, you know, um, openly, Okay, I write this and come and arrest me. You know me, you know my address. Okay, what's going on here? I think uh, it's something historical in Turkey. Uh, because in Turkey, we got a long history of oppression coming from the government uh, to on, especially on intellectuals. It uh, exactly started uh, 150 years ago in seven, uh, 1871. You know, uh, the Ottoman administration at the time started to ban uh, magazines, you know, books, and pushing intellectuals going to Europe, especially to France in exile. And uh, since then, every decade has got their own uh, generation who experienced the same terrifying torture, oppression, you know, imprisonment. But then we see that a long history of oppression in Turkey created a long history of resistance. People say, okay, we are ready to go to prison. Now, Errol's case, Errol is likely going to prison very soon. Where is he leaving now? He's in Istanbul. People are not leaving you know, the country because maybe that's the terrifying part for Erdogan's regime. They see that, okay, they cannot um, possess people in this country. People do not, uh, you know, surrender. And it's, it's not just a matter of uh, one or 10 or 100 people. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are like this, you know. Um, only pro-Kurdish party has got active support of 6 million people and their leader and their representative, their parliamentarians are in prison. Do they surrender? No. And the same for women's, uh, you know, Activists, same for LGBT uh, activists, just happened to them uh, before yesterday. 
uh, okay, everything is uh, seems to be, uh, you know, unpleasant and uh, in darkness, but still we have hope. That, that's what I feel. We have hope and we will have hope. I wish we ended on this uh, really inspiring note, but I have to go with more questions. <laughs> but this is a very inspiring turn. Thank you for that. Um, Caroline, I have a, a question to you from a, a journalist here in Washington from Voice of America, Izad Shainkaya. And um, she's asking, um, how did the Turkish government use the pretext of the coup attempt to justify the mass jailing of journalists um, in particular? And she's asking, could you compare the post-2016 coup crackdowns uh, to the court cases against the journalists before the 2016 coup attempt. And it would be great, she says, if you could give some specific examples or findings from the indictment project. Well, I would certainly share um, the indictment project report with her. Um, we have it in English and Turkish, and it's from 2020. We launched it last week. Um, we are working on another 10 indictments this year. I think um, it's a little bit of a leading question and a difficult question um, to be asked to comment on, because uh, what she's asking me to comment on is whether the Turkish administration had a, a plan perhaps, or a, um, you know, a forecasted plan of action that was then triggered by this attempted coup. I'd rather not um, comment on on whether the coup was 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 um, was was for real or not, because this, that's that is um, that that would just be um, uh, I would just be speculating. So there's no, I, I prefer to deal in concrete and practical facts if I can, and I think that was the beauty of the project that we did is we looked at, you know, at what is our job as NGOs and as pen organisations? We have to talk to our colleagues in Turkey, flag up uh, the issues. We are the Clear on the back of the dog. We are talk. We are, we are trying to advocate with European institutions, with our own governments, and, and with and with um, mechanisms in Turkey as well. Let's not forget the Ministry of Justice and the Justice Academy, with whom we will be advocating with this final report. But um, we, but really the um, um, the the, pro the report. Yes, I, I thought what I was going to say is the the. Um, our, our pen work is combined with legal work, which is why it's so valuable, is because we have a more scientific approach now. And the, um, the government of Turkey have already shown an interest in uh, last year's project when we began to publish. Um, we, we've had um, communications with the ambassador in Oslo because we are pen Norway, and we have a channel of, of communication open there now. Concrete findings of the report. Well, let's look at Osman Kavala. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, let's look at the Osman Kavala case. Um, uh, it was studied, the, the indictment was 657 pages long. So what we will be asking for is a template indictment so that they have to cover every point of law 170, article 170 of the, of the Turkish procedural code, which governs how the procedural matters in the court take place. Some indictments are half a page, one page long. Some are 657 pages. So there's no um, standardization. There are big mistakes in even the spelling of the names, there, that many things are copy and pasted. There is a practice of, um, it's also sloppy practice really, but now it, it's willful. Um, when they're copying, they copy and paste the arrest report that's taken in the police station and they copy it straight into the beginning of the indictment and this happens every single time we've been in cases in uh, in turkey monitoring when um the name of another defendant has been read out because a chunk of the indictment has been copied from another one and suddenly the name jan Nundar pops up in somebody else's indictment so it's very simple bad practice there is a linguistic and, and, and legal language issue here too which, I mean, I, I'm a, a translator, a legal translator and literary translator. So the Turkish language is, does run on the clause after clause, the sentences are wonderful, they're very long. And we all have difficult legal languages in our own countries or legal registers, but there's no effort to separate out the evidence in different sections. So you just get one long sentence in Turkish in a, in a one or two page indictment, which will actually just mentions everything and then finishes it off. But another example is that sometimes 
the history of a terror organization will be listed. There will be a secret witness, secret informant, which may be a police officer, and, and that's it. That's that's the case is closed. So they say they say that people are, are accused of being members of a terror organization because they've attended one rally. They may have had a flyer found in their home as a journalist or a couple of books that are banned amongst hundreds of books. So it's all very tenuous. But I think the main issue we found is they don't make any effort to, well, they never list the evidence in favour of the defendant, which they should do, and then they never make a reasonable argument to prove that there's reasonable suspicion that that person committed that crime. They simply pull out in Denis Yücel, the, the um, Die Welt newspaper in Berlin's correspondent for Turkey, in his case, he was reporting on Turkish foreign policy and on a meeting with um, a um, senior member of the PKK, and he the articles were out of uh, the period in which they could be prosecuted. The press law, you know, states for some it's four months, but it, you know, um, it, there's just so many irregularities, but they are all listed in our report. We have recommendations which are um, that also we recommend that these public figures do not interfere with the court cases. They mustn't make public comments incriminating um, suspects whilst the case is going on. Um, but we'd be very happy to share the report and we'll be advocating with it to the Ministry of Justice and Justice Academy because we would like to implement, for them to implement training for, 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 um, for prosecutors simply, and I'll finish now, simply because Osman Kavala, as, as Asena Hanum knows very well, waited 16, 17 months in prison, in solitary confinement, in Silivri prison, where there are 23,000 other prisoners. He waited that long without knowing with what he was being charged. And it is your right in, in, under the European Convention to be swiftly brought before a judge and to know the details of the crime which is being alleged against you. So we do not want people, prosecutors, to retrospectively try and find evidence or to leave people in pretrial detention for a couple, for nearly two years while they are writing very, very lengthy indictments which are ideological and not legally based. Well, thank you for that comprehensive answer we're already two minutes overboard so i'm going to have to end this panel but uh, i want to thank everybody um, for joining this i think this was a very informative discussion my very quick takeaways are that rule of law in turkey is in really bad shape the response from the not international community or ngos but governments pretty bad um, and yet people are still writing and joining journalism and uh, you know engaging in efforts to try to change the way the the course of turkey their country uh, is headed so i want to uh, end this in that slightly more inspiring hopeful note but thank you all for um joining and thank you to our audience for um watching the, uh, this I, I think i thought it was an excellent discussion and uh, we hope to do it again um thank you Thank you.